Hi, I'm Effie. I work for Pinterest on the performance team. And today I'm going to talk to you about the Android operating system and how does the operating system look like from the inside. So the first question that I want to answer is, is Linux, is Android based on Linux and what does that mean? So you might have heard that before, you might have noticed it. Um, Linux is an operating system that comes in many flavors. It comes in many um, different, meant for different things. There's like embedded parts. There's like um, Linux distributions for computers. And then there's the question, is Android um, also a Linux distribution like the ones we can see on our computers? And the answer to that is mostly no, because Android is based on Linux, especially on the kernel level. The kernel level is identical. But from there on, it's way different. It has its own implementation of all the other parts of the operating system. And thus, it's based on Linux, but it's not a Linux distribution. And in a very like straightforward term, we, can, we cannot take an Android app and run it on a Linux-based computer. And we cannot take um, a Linux-based app and run it on our Android phone. So today I want to cover um, the very basic of the Android architecture. And I am going to cover these topics starting from the bottom and working our way up to the top, where the bottom is our kernel, our init process, some daemons that I'm going to talk about, and mainly the zygote, um, the system server, and at the top part is the apps that we build and run. So starting from the bottom, I'm going to start with speaking about the kernel. And the kernel is a computer program that is the core of the computer operating system. It has a complete control over everything in the system. It's the first program that's been loaded on startup. And it manages um, our CPUs. It manages our memory. It manages our devices, things like which processes are going to get what CPU time, allocating memory and not allocating memory, accessing devices, hard drives, keyboards, etc. And a process is an instance of a computer program that is being executed right now. So let's talk a little bit about the Android kernel. And like I said, it's built on the Linux kernel, which means that it's identical in things such as CPU management, memory management, permissions. And it is very, very similar to the Linux kernel that you will see on computers. But it has some um, modifications that were made to it um, to match the fact that, this, uh, that the Android kernel was meant to work on a phone and not on a computer. Um, the reason why um, Android is using the Linux kernel is that the Linux kernel has proven models that are working for things like CPU management, device management, and memory management. So we know all these things are already working. They've been tested. They've been developed by many developers and have been used by many users. Um, and it's open source, so we can change it. We can make a lot of modifications to it. Which is, so using the same one is very convenient. Um, and the modifications that were made to it are mostly based on the fact that um, the Android is a phone, so it has a little bit of different uh, needs than a computer. For example, we need to manage power more conservatively because the user will be using our apps and using the phone throughout the day and not be connected to a power source. And um, things like hardware might be a little more limited. We don't have exactly the same hardware or the same options for hardware. We usually have uh, a more inferior, like less memory, um, less strong CPUs. So Android is, has made a few modifications to the kernel. And I'm going to talk about the two that I think are the most important ones. 
And the first one that I'm going to talk about is the out-of-memory killer. And the out-of-memory killer is based on a pattern that users don't typically close apps. It's not like a computer where you would use an app for an extended period of time and then you just click on X and close it. Users on a phone tend to have very short interactions with many different apps and they need always to for their phone to be responsive because in the middle of using one app, they might get a notification or a phone call from another app, they'll switch to another app, they'll quickly change between apps and all this time they need to have memory. And like I said just a second ago, phones usually have less memory than computers and less tricks to use more memory because computers can have more tricks in their sleeve to use more memory. Phones don't necessarily have those tricks. And that means that we need to be very, very conservative about our memory and make sure that if the user quickly switches to another app or gets a notification or a phone call, there is enough memory out that can be allocated to that app for that operation to occur smoothly. And if there isn't, then really bad things happen. So this is a list of processes that I pulled off the phone that I was using at the time. And you can see that um, this is the list of services, processes that were running on my phone at that exact time. And there are a total of 30 processes. And in the next minute, I started, I opened up my camera and started taking pictures. And this is a Nexus 5X, so it doesn't have a lot of memory. And a few seconds later, when I query the number of processes, I see that they were trimmed down to 26. Now, I didn't close any apps. I didn't do anything in particular to make these apps go away. What happened was that the camera and taking pictures is a very heavy operation that takes a lot of memory. And the kernel woke up and said, oh, I need to make sure that we don't run out of memory and started um, trimming trimming our apps and trimming apps that were not needed. And the way that it does it is the kernel just has certain thresholds and certain watermarks. And when it reaches a certain watermark, it will wake up, say all the processes that are ranked below a certain importance level can be trimmed until I have enough memory to keep going. If I can't, it'll just go higher and higher in this ranking until it has enough memory to keep going. It's not even to keep going, just enough memory for future allocations. The second adaptation that I want to talk about is the wake clocks. And the wake clocks are basically a way to say, if no one's holding a wake clock, the CPU goes to sleep which is another way to preserve power in a battery-based phone that doesn't have a lot of battery and should stay awake for as long as possible. So if no one's holding a wake clock, the CPUs go to sleep. And if someone's holding a wake clock, then that CPU will keep on working. So typically, this is what you'll see if you query your phone as to how many wake clocks there are. Maybe there's like, tiny bits of seconds where API calls are being sent or like an activity is being rendered, you'll see a wake clock for like a split second. But this is what you'll see the majority of the time. And in order, for example, to see more than zero wake clocks, if I have a continuous operation on the phone, such as watching video, and then query the number of wake clocks I have on my phone, I'll see that in this case, I have two, one for audio and one for video. And they are keeping my CPU awake and rendering video. Um, those are the main two things I wanted to talk about regarding the kernel. Like I said, there's a bunch of other changes that were being made to the Android kernel. Um, but like I said, I think these are the most relevant ones. The second part that I want to talk about is the init process. The init process is the first process to leave kernel space and it's called a user space, be executed in user space. 
It's a binary that's picked up by the kernel and is being run on startup. It has a list of other processes to start with the settings that are required to start them. So, like I said, it's the first user space process we're exiting our kernel. It is the root of all other processes. All the other processes will be created and spawned from it. So these processes are typically daemons. Daemons are computer programs that run in the background and the user cannot interact with them. They don't have any like UI or certain ways to like interact with them. Um, and I named some of them that might look familiar to you, such as the install D, which is used to install apps, or the log D, which is used to log stuff, the ADBD. And the biggest one I, I um, circled was the zygote, which is um, what I'm gonna talk about next. So the zygote is a special process. The zygote is the base of all the applications that we will later run. And it's technical, it's, so we are running apps, we're running them in Java, we're writing them in Java or Kotlin, and we're running them in, start in a virtual machine. And that virtual machine can be either Delvic or Art. Zygote is a process that is the virtual machine that is ready to run any app. Just give it uh, an activity to run, just give it Java code to run, and it can do it. And this is, um, all, the, all our apps, all our apps will run from processes that originate from Zygote. And this is why um, we can take this process, make children processes out of it, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. And we will already have our entire runtime environment set up and ready to run our app. So Zygote has the, like I said, the runtime environment, some preloaded resources, and some preloaded classes to run any app. This saves a lot of time on the startup of our app, because for any app that we want to run, we don't have to initiate Zygote from scratch and initiate the runtime machine from scratch. We can just take this process, clone it, and it's ready to go. It's ready to run any app. So typically in Linux, there are two commands that are being used to create a new process. And the first one is fork. And fork means take our parent uh, process, copy it, clone it, and create a child process from it. And then the second command that is being executed is exec. And exec means take the child process that was just created, delete everything that was on it, delete all the, all the code that was running, and make room for a new process to start from scratch on our very new process. Zygote, when, is, when it's being forked, it's being forked identically, it's being created to a child process, and then exact isn't being executed. So we're, being, we're only calling fork. There's a child process that is identical to the parent. And again, just a ready to go, runtime environment that can run any app. And this is the stack trace of many exceptions that I guess a lot of de developers would see. All the way at the bottom, Zygote is there because all our processes originate from it. Now, usually, in Linux, apps under the same user share uh, files and share memory and share a lot of resources between them. Um, user being me or you or an admin. Now, in Android, a different approach was taken and it was meant to create some sort of a sandbox that would isolate every process. 
And in order for processes to not be able to share resources between them, which would make them less secure, because if processes can access other processes' memory, then they can corrupt that memory and they can do nasty things to it. In Android, every process gets its own user ID. It pretends that every process is its own user. So that way, processes, each process run in their own secure sandbox and cannot access each other's resources. And this is, again, a list of the process IDs. And you can see that they're all different, which, again, means that they cannot mess with each other's memory or files. Which leads me to the next topic, which is the binder. And since I just finished telling you about how each Android process has its own user ID and is secure and cannot talk to each other, um, the next phase is the mechanism that is used for processes to communicate with each other. And it's called the binder IPC. So I pulled this code from um, just standard writing Android apps. And maybe you've seen it or something similar. It's calling something called connectivity manager. It's getting that connectivity manager from somewhere. It's a system service. And it's asking that someone else, it's, it's another process, it's another something else. It's asking it a question. It's telling the, it, get active network info. Get me what the, user, what the phone is on right now. Now, the reason why we're asking someone else, we're asking another process this question and not writing this code ourselves. Why is our app not asking? Are we on VPN? What is the signal strength? And things like that is that if we were to write this code inside our own app, it would make our app very insecure because we would have to have the permissions to query things like our uh, network driver, our, the VPN status, the, the Wi-Fi status. We would need permissions to access all these resources. And by delegating that responsibility to someone else, by telling the connectivity manager, please give me that information, the connectivity manager will be the thing that has all these permissions, and my app doesn't need all of these permissions. Now, say I want to look at the code that actually does it and see what it does, and I click on navigate to source from my app, this is what I'll see. I'll see sort of a stub. There's nothing really here. It's just iConnectivity Manager some service, and the method itself is just a wrapper around that M service calling this method. It's not the code itself. It's not the logic. And if I have AOSP and I search for this interface, again, I just get a simple interface with no implementation and no actual code. So what is actually happening here? Where is that code? Where is our connectivity manager? And the answer is that the connectivity manager is sitting in a different process and is communicating with my app through something called the binder. And it's going through my app all the way down through the Java interface classes to the binder, to the kernel, and then back to another process, binder classes, Java interface, and the second process. And I'm going to cover this journey by starting again at the bottom and talking first about the kernel model and working our way up. So starting from the kernel, the kernel is the only actual thing that accesses these two processes and connects them. It is the mailman that says, oh, I got a package from process one and I need to deliver it to process two. And it's the thing that will um, keep tabs and keep all the references and know which objects are alive and which objects are dead and what to do in those cases and who should I deliver this package to. 
Now, above that um, kernel model, there is the Java code that will actually call the kernel model. And it will call it by calling a method called transact. And the receiver side will be receiving it on a method called onTransact. Now, this, these methods are very generic. They are not, I want to call a specific method. What they do is they take a package, a parcel, and move it and, and give it to someone else. So we will see something very abstract here, which is called a parcel with the data and a parcel reply. But this is not really what we are doing as developers. We're calling a method on some for some on someone else's process basically and we're getting a result which is usually a class so somebody needs to handle all this hard work of taking our method our method call with the maybe parameters that we wanted to give it and turn it into a parcel and on the receiver side we need to open up that parcel figure out what is the actual method that was that we wanted to call call it, get back the result, turn the result back into a parcel, and send it back to whoever called this method. And for this part, there is something called the AIDL tool that generates from the classes that we gave it the, the parcel and does all the marshalling and unmarshalling, and it is the bridge that connects the actual method and uh, abstract transaction object. It generates two parts. One of them is the proxy, which will be alive on the sender side, and the, the stub, which will be on the receiving side. And this is the code that the AIDL generates. It's a lot of boilerplate coding that, I mean, we could write ourselves, but it's not, it's not that much of a joy. And in the middle there, you will see that um, we are calling mremote.transact, and that is after writing all the things that we needed to write, creating the parcels, um, doing all this uh, cumbersome work that we wouldn't want to do ourselves. And on the stub side, which is the receiving side, we will open up this parcel, we will figure out what actual method we wanted to call by the, the code that was sent. And in the middle there, we will call this, which is the actual object, get active network, which is the actual method that we wanted to write. And if I navigate to source on this particular method, there is the real code and the real logic that happens when we are asking the service give us what is the active network status. And if we debug our original code, the original line of get active network info, and we are looking to see what is our M service, our abstract M service, it is in fact the proxy. So to complete the journey, um, app one calls some method, some method on some other processes, on some other app's interface. This method will be transformed into something called a parcel by the Java interface classes. Then um, these classes will call transact with our parcel with the marshaled objects. And the binder will take this call transact, turn it into a system call. The system call will call into the kernel. The kernel will figure out where does it go, who is the recipient of this message, and it will invoke a system call on the binder's app2 side. The app2 side method that will get invoked is the on transact. And this on transact will figure out again, open up this parcel, we'll figure out what to do with it, and we'll call the actual object, actual method on app2. The 
The last piece of the puzzle that I want to talk about is the system server. The system server, I drew two arrows that lead to it because it was started by init. And it is also a child of Zygote because it's written in Java and it has managed code that's running in either Delvic or Art. So it's just another instance of Zygote. And it's the core part of the Android operating system. It manages a lot of different things. It's actually many different services all wrapped into one process. And some of these things are things such as locations, such as power, such as Wi-Fi. And some of these things um, I'm going to cover next. And they are the activity manager, window manager, and package manager. So basically what we have is just a lot of different managers. They're all, like I said, wrapped up in the same process. And the system, the system server is managing our apps, it's managing the operating system, it's providing a lot of core functionality that um, Android operating system needs. So if we go a little bit more in depth about the window manager, the window manager is responsible for everything windowy. It's responsible to keep track of the, Windows acti the window activity, what surfaces do we have, how many, which application or which uh, activity has which surfaces, what is visible and what is not visible. It's responsible for transitions and animations and providing good UI experience, for example, in case of um, rotating the phone. And it's also responsible for system level gestures, which means that if we didn't handle a particular, for example, on click or another UI gesture, it bubbles up until it reaches the, the window manager, which will then decide who handles it and deliver it to whatever man, whatever is responsible for that. The second manager that I want to talk about is the package manager. The package manager is responsible for installing new apps and resolving uh, activities for us or creating a list of activities in case there's more than one activity that can match a certain filter, a certain intent. And what it, re what it has is the package manager will take all our manifest files, all the manifest files that exist in the, in, in our, on our Android phones from all the apps that are currently installed. And it will take from it the list of all the activities, processes, uh, services, background services, everything that it can uh, use, it can take out of it, and it will, it, it will create a list in memory of all those uh, activities, components, Android components. And then later, it, when asked, oh, I need something to match this particular intent, whether explicit or, impl or implicit, it will be able to give either that one particular activity or component that was asked for, or again, a list of possible ones in case um, there's more than one. The last component that I want to talk about is the activities manager. It is probably the most important one because it is the thing that actually manages our activities. And when again I say activities, I also mean uh, services, broadcast receivers, everything. So it's responsible for managing our applications. It's responsible for managing the application's lifestyle. So this is the thing that makes the decision about which app is resumed, which app is paused, which app is stopped. That's, that's the component that's making these decisions. It's uh, managing the actual user, and in that case, yes, that's whoever is actually using the phone right now. It's responsible for memory trimming and managing excessive power usage. In case uh, some activity goes rogue, it will kill it. And it is also responsible to handle configuration changes and say, okay, now in a configuration change, 
let me uh, dis uh, go through the entire life cycle of a certain activity or not, depends on the setting. And when it manages applications, it arranges them in logical groups. And the logical groups that um, it manages is it creates a stack. There can be uh, one or more stacks existing at any given moment. In the case, for example, of a split screen, there will be two stacks. Each stack will contain a task. A task is roughly a process, but not always. It's a list of, and a task is a list of activities in some sort of order. Now, up until now, I spoke a lot about processes and I also started going back to activities, which is what we actually build. And I want to talk a little bit more about the correlation between them and how they exist together. So the activity manager creates something called an activity record for every activity that exists in and for any app or for all our apps. And the activity manager knows about our activities in which process they sit in, and it arranges them, like I said, in, in, a, in a task. In this particular case, it's super simple. There is activity manager holds one activity record for one activity that sits in, a, in one process. If another um, activity were to be created that belongs to the same app, that activity would live in the same process and another activity record would be created, that, activity, that new activity record is now the resumed activity. The activity that existed before is now stopped. Now, say, now, okay, another, um, completely new app was created with a completely new activity. That new activity would create would be created in a new process, and then we would have two processes for our two apps, and one of them would create would contain two activities. The new one would contain one activity. Now this is where things get a little more mixed up, and this is the special case of I opened another app's activity from my app. For example, I am taking a picture with my phone from another app, from the Twitter app. And in that case, my current um, stack will contain, my current uh, task will contain two activities. One of them belonged to my original app. The other one belonged to actually another app, which means that it would also live in another process. And in managing life cycle, when the um, activity manager manages the life cycle, um, it is responsible to determine and do many things. And I put some examples here of the activity manager's responsibilities. Um, so, for example, it is responsible to make sure that there's only one resumed app at all times. Even when there are, even in split screen or in picture in picture mode, there's always only one resumed app at all times. It is determining and telling the window manager which uh, apps have surfaced and are visible. Um, it is also determining the thread priority, the CPU affinity. If some apps, if some processes are more important than others, they will get special treatment by the CPU. Um, it can give or take certain permissions from certain apps. If an app is stopped, for example, if an activity an app is stopped, for example, it cannot use camera. And it is also responsible for making out of memory adjustments which is um, what I'm gonna cover in a bit. Because, 
So going back to the kernel, we said that the kernel wakes up every, thresh every time a threshold was reached and kills a bunch of processes below that, um, below some sort of importance level until it has enough memory to keep going. Um, but the kernel knows about processes. It doesn't know about activities. And it doesn't know which of those activities are important and which of those activities are less important. So the thing that makes this connection that um, puts it together is the activity manager because the activity manager knows about activities. It knows which activity is resumed right now. It knows which service is um, being used or perceivable by the user. It knows that um, our phone is a very, like our phone um, getting calls is very important and shouldn't kill, don't kill this process. And it knows all these things that the kernel just doesn't know. The kernel only has a list of processes. So the thing that is responsible for scoring and actually telling the kernel later which processes are more important than others is our activity manager. So if we go back to our list of apps that um, we, pulled out, we pulled before, we can see that they are ranked by and, and grouped into certain groups. And they are ranked by order of importance. And again, the kernel will start from the bottom and will work its way up until it reaches the top. And for that particular matter, it doesn't even matter which process is using more or less memory. If the process, for example, if the app that we're using, the app that is resumed right now, is using a lot of memory, it will not be a good candidate to be killed by the out-of-memory uh, killer because we're using it right now. So it's important to know that it, I mean, it does matter how much memory it uses, but it doesn't matter even if it's using way more memory than all of the 10 processes that exist below it and are not being used by the user right now. So if we look at it, the most important service is the system service. After that are, about, uh, are a bunch of persistent uh, services that need to stay around. After that comes the uh, foreground, the resumed activity. After that are a bunch of perceivable services, maybe playing music or things that, again, the user are, is aware of. And then we go down uh, some, some cached ones, some, some not very often used ones. So in the activity manager, uh, every time something changes, every time a new activity is created, every time um, activity is paused or stopped, this, these methods will be called that will calculate again the out of memory score for every process and will apply it. And then if the kernel did wake up and killed a bunch of processes, then the activity manager service will get notified of these changes and it will know that these processes don't exist anymore, these activities don't, in them don't exist anymore, and they can be removed. Um, so for the um, last few minutes that we have, I want to go through uh, a flow of starting a new activity and how does that work in in the activity manager. So it starts by start activity as user and sort of bubbles down a little bit, goes through a bunch of other methods. And the first the first thing that will happen is that the activity manager will call the package manager to find the correct activity that needs to be started. Now, again, if this activity is explicit, then we want a certain activity, it will return one thing, that activity that we wanted. If it's a, an implicit activity and we have implicit intent and we have more than one, we'll get back a list of possible activities and what will happen then is a special activity, which is the chooser. 
The second thing that will happen is a new activity record will be created with all the information that we need to uh, know about this activity and its status. The third thing that will happen is the window manager will allocate a window to this uh, new activity. It will do things such as prepare the animations that are required to switch between uh, different activities and um, prepare its own window record for that activity. In this particular case, because we're going through a very straightforward flow, um, this activity is now the top activity, something that the user clicked on and wants to see. So this activity will also be in the resume state. Since it's in the resume state, it needs to run. And in order for it to run, we are asking, do we have a process for this app already? Or are we creating a new process right now? It's maybe a new app that the user is starting. And if it is a new app, we will create a new process for it by creating a process record and calling uh, process start. And process start will call Zygote and tell Zygote to fork itself and create an identical copy of itself. And once that identical copy calls back to the activity manager service and is like, okay, I'm I'm cloned, I'm ready to run your, your app that you want to run right now. The activity manager service will determine again which activity, which activity was I going to put in there? Okay, this one. And it will put attach the correct activity to the brand new uh, process. <laughs> and that's it. We now have a new activity running. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>